This program is about pumps, specifically centrifugal pumps and their use in oil and gas operations. When you're pumping air, oil, water, or NGLs, all pumps operate on one common principle. They move something from one place to another. A lot of different types of pumps are used in the petroleum industry. Two kinds are seen most often. Those with pistons or gears, they're called positive displacement pumps. And those we'll talk about today, centrifugal pumps. Another module focuses on positive displacement pumps, so we won't spend any time on those right now. So, when are centrifugal pumps used? Usually when you have to move a lot of fluid. Like emptying storage tanks, moving processed fluids and gas plants, providing emergency fire water, circulating cooling tower water, and, well, many, many other applications. What we're saying is that you'll see and work with centrifugal pumps just about every day. So you need to understand them. And this module will help you do just that. This is the first section of a four section module on centrifugal pump principles. This section introduces the various parts and operations of centrifugal pumps. Why are centrifugal pumps used so much? Because they're versatile, simple in construction, and relatively inexpensive to buy. They're also easier and less expensive to operate, maintain, and repair. But just what is a centrifugal pump? Let's start by looking at its primary components. When we break it down, we see that a centrifugal pump is actually quite simple, with only six main parts. These are the casing, the impeller, the shaft, the coupling, the bearings, and the seals, or packing. Let's look first at the casing. It's the biggest and most obvious part. Its main job is to house and protect the pump parts inside. It can be made from cast iron, steel, bronze, or even special materials, if that's what the job calls for. This is the impeller. It's the part of the centrifugal pump that imparts energy to whatever fluid is being pumped. The impeller is tightly attached to the shaft and rotates at the shaft speed. Impellers can be made from different materials, most commonly cast iron. When corrosive fluids are being pumped, impellers are most often made of stainless steel, plastic, or some special material. This is the shaft. It's connected to a driver, which might be an electric motor, an engine, or a steam turbine. The shaft turns the impeller. Steel is the most common material for shafts. Let's stop. Here's the driver. There's the pump itself. What links them? This, the coupling. It connects or couples the driver to the pump. And it does so for a purpose to transmit power from the drive shaft to the pump shaft. Although they might seem simple, couplings are as critical as all the other components. They've got to be strong enough to withstand sudden changes in the pump's load and also those times when the driver might stop. Now to bearings. They support the shaft and reduce friction as it rotates in the casing. They do even more. They control the forward and backward movement, the thrust of the shaft, as well as the shaft side-to-side -side or radial movement. That keeps the shaft from rubbing against the pump casing. Bearings can be here, in the pump casing on small process pumps, or separated in special housings on larger ones. Last are seals, or packing. They're used to stop or cut fluid leakage around the shaft. That's how a centrifugal pump's built. Now let's see how it works. Centrifugal force is the key. It's that force that tends to move an object away from the center of rotation. Sound too theoretical? 
A common example will show that you already understand the principle. The example, children riding a merry-go-round. They spin, and children move outward. And as they do, they're subjected to a lot stronger outward force that tends to force them off the ride. That outward movement is called centrifugal. How does this relate to centrifugal pumps? In this way. When a centrifugal pump is working, the impeller rotates. Its blades stir the fluid, making that fluid rotate with the impeller itself. It's like a mini hurricane. The circular motion generates enough force to move the fluid away from the center of the impeller to the tips of the impeller blades. The movement of the fluid to the outside edge of the impeller creates a suction at the eye of the impeller that draws more fluid into the pump. If we look at the movement of an impeller, we note that the outside edge of the impeller travels faster than the inside center. So, to stay up with the impeller, the fluid has to move faster as it moves outward. That increases the energy of the fluid. The fluid leaves the outside edge of the impeller. As it does, what happens? It enters a specially designed area of the casing known as the volute. The volute is wider at the discharge nozzle than where the fluid leaves the impeller. There's more space which causes the fluid to slow down. Its velocity decreases. The fluid gives up some of its energy. But that's not all. Energy just doesn't disappear. It's converted into pressure. And that pressure forces the fluid out of the discharge nozzle. The fluid leaves the pump at a higher pressure than when it enters. So what does all this mean? Centrifugal pumps move fluids by increasing fluid pressure through centrifugal force. This concludes section one. Stop the tape now and refer to your student manual. There you'll find additional information and a review. View this section of tape again if you'd like. And when you feel you're ready, just start the tape again and we'll go on to section two. So what do we now know? The major parts of a centrifugal pump and how the pump itself basically works. In this section, we'll learn more about the external components and what they do. This is the second section of a four-section module on centrifugal pump principles. This section covers external components. By external components, we mean those parts that can be seen when you walk up to an operating pump. Specifically, we're talking about the casing, the stuffing box, the bearing housing, and the coupling. Casings are usually made of cast iron for low pressure pumps and of steel for high pressure pumps. Steel or cast iron casings serve three primary purposes. They house the internal parts, keeping them in the proper position and protecting them as well. They can find the fluid being pumped and direct its flow. And finally, they form the volute and connection points for suction and discharge piping. Pump casings have two designs, solid or split. Solid construction casings have a removable cover or faceplate that gives you easy access to the impeller. They're called solid because the discharge casing is one piece. Split construction pump casings are either axial or radial. They're axial if the split is along the center line of the shaft. If it is, the upper half of the casing can be removed, giving easy access to the pump shaft, impeller, and bearings. Radial splits are perpendicular to the center line of the shaft. 
The advantage of this design is that the casing can be made up in segments and bolted together to form one pump. With some larger centrifugal pumps, there's a gland sealing line that supplies sealing fluid to the packing in the stuffing box. Most often, the sealing line delivers fluid to the stuffing box from the upper casing. Sometimes, though, the sealing fluid may come from an external source, particularly if the pump is pumping a corrosive or abrasive substance. There's another difference on larger centrifugal pumps. The external section of the lower casing half may form a small open well to catch fluid leakage. There is a pipe called a slop drain at the bottom of this well. Leakage can be drained through this pipe. Now let's take a look at the stuffing box. It holds the packing gland. That gland, in turn, is designed to regulate fluid leakage around the shaft. We'll talk more about pump packing in the next section. A gland follower is also found with the stuffing box. Basically, it's a bushing designed to hold and compress the packing gland in the stuffing box. Bolts usually hold gland followers in place. They're also used to adjust the gland follower's position. These are bearing housings. They support and protect bearings. There are different types of bearings. We'll look at them and their purposes in the section three. Right here, next to the bearing housing, are flinger rings, or shields. They're attached to the pump shaft and fling fluid leakage from the packing gland away from the pump shaft. That keeps the fluid from leaking into the bearings. You already know that on most centrifugal pumps, couplings join the shafts of the driver and the pump. They have to be flexible enough to handle misalignments between the shafts, as well as changes in the driver's speed. Alignment of both shafts is critical for good, smooth operation of the pump as a whole. If they're not aligned correctly, the shafts and other pump parts will vibrate. If that vibration gets serious, it can put enough pressure on the shafts and couplings to break them. Vibration can do other damage too. It can cause bearings to wear, internal parts to rub, and impellers to become unbalanced. Now this is just to name a few of the problems. When any of these occur, we've got downtime and equipment that needs to be repaired. In the next section, we'll look at the internal components of centrifugal pumps. Stop the tape now and review this section. View the tape again if you wish, and then move on to the next section when you feel you're ready. We now know centrifugal pumps from the outside. In this section, we'll look at them from the inside and focus on internal components. This is the third section of a fourth section module on centrifugal pump principles. This section covers internal components. External components are visible. Internal ones aren't until the pump is drained and disassembled. Centrifugal pumps have six main internal components. The pump shaft, the impeller, wear rings, the volute, packing or mechanical seals, and bearings. The internal parts of a centrifugal pump are mounted on the pump shaft. It's a single piece of metal that's been machined to fit the pump perfectly. The shaft is usually made of stainless steel or some other corrosive resistant material. And for a very practical reason, replacing broken or worn out shafts is expensive. Some pumps have a shaft sleeve or metal cylinder that fits over the shaft and protects it from damage. 
it's easier and cheaper to replace this sleeve than the shaft itself. This circular device is an impeller. The impeller fits snugly on the shaft and is usually pressed on. It can be held in place by several methods, but the most common is with a key and key way. The impeller is the most critical part of a centrifugal pump. Why? Because its size and shape and the speed at which it turns determine pump capacity. There are three types of impellers, open, semi-open, and closed. Open impellers basically are vanes mounted on a shaft with just enough backing or shroud to keep the vanes rigid. Semi-open impellers are completely covered on one side of the vanes. Closed impellers have shrouds covering both sides of the vanes. They also have a central hole or eye on one or both sides. That hole lets fluid enter the impeller. Impellers are also classified as single or double suction. With single suction impellers, fluid can enter only one of the impeller's sides. That can cause problems such as imbalancing thrusts in the direction of the suction. In high volume or high discharge pressure pumps, that problem can be serious. It's resolved by using a double suction impeller. This type lets fluid enter both sides of the impeller. That makes the thrust generated on one side of the impeller counter the thrust from the other side. Pumps also come in stages, single or multiple. A single stage pump will work fine for many applications and will raise pressure sufficiently. But there are times where more discharge pressure is needed. It's possible to raise that pressure by increasing the rotation speed of the impeller or by increasing the impeller size. But that's not generally done because of design and material limitations. That's where multi-stage pumps come in. They have two or more single suction impellers mounted on a single shaft. The discharge port of the first impeller is directed to the suction port of the second, and so on through additional stages. When the fluid flows from one stage to the next, fluid pressure is increased. We know the impeller has to rotate. In centrifugal pumps, there's a space between the impeller and the casing so that the impeller won't rub against the casing. The space keeps both the impeller and the casing from wearing out, but also allows the fluid to leak back from the discharge to the suction side of the pump. Wear rings are installed in this space to control fluid leakage, but not to stop it altogether, since some leakage is important for lubrication and for counteracting the thrust and radial forces that build up inside the pump. When wear rings are attached to casing, they're called casing wear rings. These are called impeller wear rings. They're fitted to the impeller. Some centrifugal pumps are fitted with both casing and impeller wear rings. Remember the volute we talked about in section one. It's the chamber that's wider at the discharge nozzle than where the fluid leaves the impeller. That increased area lets the fluid slow down. And as it does, some of the fluid's kinetic energy is converted to pressure. Volute casings are either single or double. In the single type, the impeller and the volute are offset from each other to give room for the increasing size of the volute. But there can be a problem with this setup. Internal fluid action in the volute tends to set up unbalanced radial forces. To reduce those forces, some centrifugal pumps use a double volute casing. The double volute casing provides a second guiding vane to split and balance the internal radial forces. There are other advantages of double volute casings. 
They give the casing greater internal strength. They also reduce some of the stress load on the casing walls. There's an alternative to the volute. It's called a diffuser. It too has a chamber, but its chamber doesn't increase in size the same way a volute does. Instead, there's a series of stationary veins that are arranged around the impeller and direct the fluid outward from the impeller. The diffuser's veins are further apart at their outermost point than at the edge of the impeller. So they create a series of widening chambers that function as a volute does in converting kinetic energy to pressure. We've already seen a lot in this section. We'll examine packing and mechanical seals along with bearings before we take our next break. What's the purpose of packing? Simply to minimize leakage along the pump shaft. It does that by sealing the clearance space between the shaft and the casing. A throat bushing keeps the gland follower from forcing the packing into the eye of the impeller. Packing is soft and pliable, usually made of cotton, asbestos, or flax. It's woven or braided into a continuous square-shaped strand. Generally, it's coated with graphite or Teflon for lubrication. And since it's softer than the shaft, there's no damage to the shaft when it rubs against the packing. Still, additional lubrication is needed to cut friction to a minimum. Some fluid leaks out of the stuffing box. That's normal, and even good, because it provides more lubrication between the shaft and packing. Lantern rings are sometimes used to pressure lubricate the packing. These perforated metal rings are located between layers of packing in the stuffing box. They allow additional fluid from the gland sealing line to be injected into the stuffing box. That helps lubricate the packing. Look closely and you'll see that this piece called a gland follower fits into the open end of the stuffing box. It holds the packing and lantern ring in place against the throat bushing. If you adjust the gland follower's pressure against the other parts of the packing gland, you can regulate the flow and leakage rate of the fluid lubricant. Although many centrifugal pumps use braided packing and stuffing boxes, in the petroleum industry, mechanical seals are more and more the norm for three key reasons. They don't require leakage, which means greater safety when pumping hydrocarbons. They last far longer than packing, and they need less maintenance. Those points are especially important if the pump's in a hard to reach or inaccessible location. There's a wide range of mechanical seals available today, but they all have similar methods of operation and similar components. Rotating parts are attached to the shaft. Stationary parts are secured to the seal plate. The seal plate is bolted directly to the casing. The highly polished sealing faces of the rotating and stationary parts are held in contact by one or more springs. In this manner, a seal is made to prevent leakage. That's the typical structure for all mechanical seals. Let's go on to bearings. Bearings basically support the shaft and reduce friction as it rotates in the casing. They also do two other things, as you'll recall from section one. They control the forward and backward movement or thrust of the shaft, and they control the side-to-side -side or radial movement of the shaft. Centrifugal pumps use two kinds of bearings, ball bearings and sleeve bearings. Inside this circular ring are smooth metal balls that are free to roll as the shaft rotates. These are ball bearings. They're usually lubricated with oil or grease. The sleeve type is stationary. It's made of smooth metal cylinders in which the shaft rotates. 
sleeve bearings are lubricated and cooled by a thin film of oil between the bearing surface and the shaft. That oil is brought to the sleeve by a ring oiler or under pressure from a lube oil pump. The ring oiler transfers oil from an oil reservoir to the pump shaft and the sleeve bearings. It's critical to lubricate bearings properly. Without adequate lubrication, bearings will overheat, rust, or corrode, and sooner or later cause the shaft to seize or stop. Centrifugal pumps can get hot, especially large pumps or those moving high temperature fluids. Excess heat is most damaging to bearings and packing glands. Sometimes this heat is carried away by the ambient air or by fluid being pumped. When it's not, water jackets are frequently used to provide additional cooling. These jackets are channels located in the casing, near bearing housings and packing glands. Water or another coolant is pumped through the channels to absorb the heat. That water or coolant is then either pumped to a sewer or to a heat exchanger to be cooled before it's recycled back through the water jackets. We've covered a lot of information in this section. Let's stop now and review the manual. Review this section of the videotape, if you need to, before proceeding on to the last section on classifying centrifugal pumps. You should feel pretty confident about centrifugal pumps now. You know a lot about both external and internal components and have a good sense of their basic functions. Let's keep building on that knowledge. And in this section, look at how centrifugal pumps are classified. This is the fourth section of a four section module on centrifugal pump principles. This section covers classification of centrifugal pumps. All centrifugal pumps operate on the same principles, regardless of the actual work they do, whether it's low to high pressure pumping, moving light to heavy fluids, pumping small to large volumes, or whatever. What distinguishes one pump from another is size, shape, and basic design. Design is most important. Pump design features normally considered in classifying pumps include shaft position, bearing position, type of impeller, number of impellers, volute design, and fluid flow. You'll hear the terms vertical and horizontal when centrifugal pumps are talked about. The terms refer to the position of the shaft during the pump's normal operation. Shafts in vertical pumps are perpendicular to the ground. The driver is usually positioned above the pump. Shafts are parallel to the ground in horizontal pumps. The driver is usually positioned beside the pump. Two other important terms are overhung and between bearings. They refer to the position of the impeller in relation to the bearings. In overhung pumps, the bearings are located on one side of the impeller. In between bearings pumps, the bearings are located on both sides of the impeller. Pumps are classified as either single or double suction. Both terms refer to the number of suction eyes in the impeller. In single suction impellers, fluid enters the impeller only through one side. In double suction impellers, there's a suction eye on both sides of the impeller. Fluid enters the pump through a single intake port, but it's then directed toward both sides of the impeller. You already know about single and multi-stage pumps. The number of impellers is the distinction here. Obviously, single-stage pumps have only one impeller. Just as clearly, multi-stage pumps have two or more impellers in series on the same shaft. The purpose of multiple impellers, as we learned earlier, is to produce higher discharge pressures than is normally possible 
with just one impeller. Volute and diffuser are also terms you now know. They describe the area in the centrifugal pump casing where the kinetic energy of the fluid is converted into pressure. In volute pumps, the casing forms a chamber, or a volute, that's wider at the discharge port than where the fluid leaves the impeller. In diffuser pumps, instead of a volute, there's a diffuser with stationary veins that form a series of widening chambers. A couple of terms used to classify centrifugal pumps that we haven't covered yet are radial flow and axial flow. In radial flow pumps, the impeller is designed to direct the fluid out at a 90 degree angle from the shaft. In axial flow pumps, the path is parallel to the shaft. Strictly speaking, axial flow pumps aren't centrifugal because they don't use centrifugal force to add energy to the fluid or to convert the velocity of the fluid to pressure. Axial flow or turbine type pumps are nevertheless frequently classified with centrifugal pumps because their parts and maintenance requirements are similar. We've got a lot of terms, right? And one by one, we can understand each. That's important to remember because a specific centrifugal pump is classified by which terms are applied to it. For example, a vertical overhung single suction, single stage radial flow volute pump with a closed impeller. That's one centrifugal pump. Another one is this one. A horizontal between bearings, single suction, multi-stage radial flow volute pump with closed impellers. Each word has meaning. Each is important. All will be needed in selecting a pump for a specific application. It's simply a matter of looking at each aspect of the pump, the way an impeller is made, the type of casing it has, whether it's horizontal or vertical, and so on. In other modules, we'll look at maintaining and selecting particular pumps for particular applications. But for now, we'll close our program on the principles of centrifugal pumps. Review your student manual. There's a lot of information to absorb. Review the sections of the tape again that you need some clarification on, and feel free to ask your instructor for more help. Remember, the use of centrifugal pumps in the oil and gas industry is widespread. The more you know about their design and operation, the better you'll be able to do your job. See you soon.